Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us and watching this uh, Facebook Live on affordable housing. Um, I am joined by our town administrator, Jim Gilday, and our town planner, Don Samet. And we just thought this would be a good time to give everybody a little bit of a history and a background um, on affordable housing, Westfield's obligations, and how we are um, planning on meeting them in a way that best meets the needs of our community. I get questions all the time, you know, what would you like to see? And everybody says, no more apartments, no more apartments. And, uh, uh, and I, I thought, especially in light of the recent um, projects that have come forward, notably Westfield Crossing, um, and we can talk about Williams Nursery a little bit, um, to talk about um, what our obligation is, where we are, and why, you know, no more apartment isn't particularly realistic in light of a court order, ordered uh, settlement that we have um, agreed to. And instead we're working on how we can all work together to ensure that um, this obligation can work in the best interest of Westfield. So with that, I thought I'd start off with Don. I'm just gonna play like Katie Corris moderator here. These two are the ones with all the history and expertise. Uh, but I thought maybe we'd start off with Don to give a little background just on affordable housing in general and New Jersey's like Mount Laurel and everything else. And then I'm gonna ask Jim to weigh in a bit on the history of Westfield's uh, uh, obligations. So the Don, a little background for us would be great. Right. Little background. Well, there's the Fair Housing Act from 1985. And, and basically the Fair Housing Act um, was intertwined with a series of cases which um, are referred to as the Mount Laurel cases. And um, folks may have heard of Mount Laurel obligations, which is really synonymous with affordable obligations for municipalities. So the Mount Laurel line of cases, the Fair Housing Act from 85, they really um, stated that each municipality in the state of New Jersey has an obligation to provide for the realistic opportunity for the development of low and moderate income housing for its fair share of um, low and moderate income housing that's needed on a statewide basis. So what you're seeing is, um, and Jim will talk a bit about the history in Westfield, but over time, towns have um, put forward housing plans based on different rounds of affordable housing regulations that um, come out basically every 10 years. For example, uh, right now, we are in what's called the third round, which covers a time period between 2015 to 2025. It's strange to think that we're more than halfway through already. Um, so each municipality has an obligation. You know, you could attempt to shirk those obligations, but if you do, then you could run into some significant issues. Um, without a town putting forward its own housing plan, um, uh, builders, developers can um, challenge the municipality by saying that you haven't met your affordable housing obligations. And then it's basically the courts that are deciding what gets built, um, how big it's going to be, where it's going to be built. And it takes the, the planning for where housing should be away from the hands of the municipality and puts it in the courts. Um, those are the so-called builders remedy lawsuits, which you'll sometimes hear about. So you know, Westfield, um, I'm proud to say, has been very proactive in its affordable housing planning, and we've really been able to, to steer the ship. Um, and we've um, really, really taken control of how we want to see our town develop, especially when it comes to or when it comes to um, meeting our affordable housing obligations, putting them in appropriate locations at appropriate densities. Um, and it's something I think we've been very successful at. Um, without going too far afield, I'll state that um, we wound up uh, initially with a very contentious relationship with um, the Fair Share Housing Center, who is really the um, agency now that's the prime advocate for low and moderate income um, households. We have our settlement agreement with them, and we've really become um, collaborators, I'll say. In, in meeting the affordable housing needs in Westfield in ways that we feel are, are most appropriate. So that's a, a bit of history, a bit of you know, where we are today, um, but I hope it, it answers the question and gives some background for us. That's great. And before I ask, send it to Jim, just a couple questions. Like, 
what prompted the Mount Laurel decision in the first place? Oh, and yeah. I, I, because I, I've heard, you know, which well, really the result of the fact that New Jersey never did really what it was supposed to do. And hence, that's why the courts got involved. And then can you also talk about, so, and that was, I know it's been going on for what, 30 years or more, mm-hmm. how towns used to be able to pay to move their affordable housing obligations elsewhere, right? And so, um, and that, that process was eliminated, I don't know how long ago. So maybe you can give a little bit of that, that background, like why did we yeah. end up with these affordable housing settlements in the first place? And then I'm gonna ask Jim to talk about our history. It's been quite some time since I've read the Mount Laurel cases, but essentially what was happening was there was some exclusionary zoning. Um, Mount Laurel was rezoning areas of the municipality in ways which there was no way it could be developed with affordable housing. Um, for example, re- requiring larger sized lots, which resulted in larger size homes, which were out of reach for low and moderate income families. Um, Yes, and the, the it was it wasn't called a payment in lieu, and the name always escapes me. Jim Jim remembered, but it was uh, yeah, the RCA RCA Regional Contribution Agreement. Municipalities used to, I guess you could describe it as being able to buy their way out of an affordable housing obligation, and that was through a contribution, a regional contribution agreement with another municipality. Um, the municipality that would be. Um, sending its obligation to another municipality, which was called the receiving municipality, would be able to essentially give money to, okay, we're not gonna build the units, they're gonna be built elsewhere, um, and we're gonna pay another municipality to um, either create those units or run a rehabilitation program within their borders, and then that sending municipality no longer has that obligation to provide it within its borders. that provision was eliminated. I believe it was uh, felt to be unfair and that it was, um, it wound up really in concentrating affordable units in more of the higher density urban areas of the state rather than um, uh, spreading the obligation. Equalizing it, right. And equalizing it, yes. So they got so, rid of it. So Jim, did Westfield ever participate in that and when? And then, can you also talk about when Don mentioned, we used to have a contentious relationship with Fair Share. Can you give a little bit of history on that and how that evolved into the collaborative relationship that exists today? Sure, uh, thank you, Mayor. And again, hello everybody. Um, so the, uh, yeah, the, as Don mentioned, um, the town, like everybody else, we had to, had, had to comply with the previous rounds back in the eighties and nineties. And we did, and we usually did that through the courts. Um, uh, that was by choice of the town many years ago. And yes, Mayor, we did, um, sometime in the eighties, I believe there was, a uh, the town did RCA agreements, regional contribution agreements with the city of Elizabeth. So there were obligations that the Westfield, uh, sent to Elizabeth. They were happy to get that, those funds to build affordable housing there. Um, there's one backup for one second, because I think it's important, um, when people, you know, you hear affordable housing and what the obligation is. Just a little, sometimes people don't understand that some of the basic facts about well, when we say someone has to build affordable housing in our town, um, there's a percentage of a facility that they're, that they're building. So if they're building 100 units, for example, uh, they have to set aside 15 or 20% of them for the affordable obligation. Um, and unless, you know, there's other ways you can do that. But it's just something that to consider. But, you know, the only reason, only way that works financially for someone to come in and build something is you have to have market rate units, obviously, to offset that. So people here affordable housing, there's not, unless it's otherwise negotiated, you're seeing a development go up of some number of units like we've had here in town, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, and a portion of them are affordable housing. And we have a whole other set of rules and regulations and process that we have in place to make sure they're filled properly with an outside consultant that Don works with very well. But real quickly, just on the history, We comply with our um, affordable housing obligations in the 80s and 90s through the courts, which either meant we had, and what you do when you comply, the town must provide an opportunity for affordable housing projects to be developed in your town. Uh, That's through zoning, as Don mentioned. You you, uh, change zoning regulations to allow that opportunity to happen. So the 80s and 90s, we did that. And just interesting fact, um, properties like Williams Nursery property, properties like, Town-owned properties over on Grandview and Myrtle Avenue, 
those were properties that were identified back in the 1991 or 92 plan, I think, uh, that was, I guess, approved in September 95 um, for affordable housing obligations to be fulfilled to those properties. This gives you a sense of, you know, those are properties that identified in, in the mid eight, in the mid nineties, that literally only today, Williams Nursery has come to us, obviously, with a proposal to finally fulfill those obligations. And of course, um, the Myrtle and Grandview properties, another very proud thing for the town. Those are town-owned properties we held on to for years, and we were able to find a willing partner, uh, not only to do affordable housing uh, for the town to complete its obligations in that area, but it ended up being special needs housing, which uh, we partnered with the Arc of Union County. Uh, and those two homes are now finished, I believe. I think one is done. I think the other one might be finalizing soon and providing special needs housing right here in Westfield for special needs adults with jobs and uh, really nice projects. And the county did a nice thing there. So, so fast forward, you know, 1990s, we complied. As Don mentioned, we are in the third round of affordable housing. And Westfield um, had, um, you know, not the, not the greatest relationship with COA. And of course, like many towns, you didn't really want to deal with COA. <laughs> um, but we did, um, we had a consultant planner for years. Uh, and in 2005 or 2006, we decided we really needed an in-house full-time planner. At that time, we hired a woman by the name of Judy Thornton, uh, who was our first full-time planner. And uh, she was uh, instrumental in getting us to getting the town council, particularly to understand the benefits of being a COA town and being part of that. And as Don mentioned, controlling your own destiny, uh, control the projects, be able to control the materials, the size. And so we began that process uh, back in 2007, eight. Um, and uh, at that point also, we had our first builder's remedy lawsuit <laughs> that came through, which prompted us then to, of course, uh, go back to the courts as we had been a court town for many years. Um, and as you mentioned, Mayor, and I'm, Jim, I'm sorry, just to clarify, because you mentioned a court town or a COA town. Sure. Just to clarify exactly what you mean by that. So basically, towns have the ability to go to the Council on Affordable Housing, otherwise known as COA, and become a COA town, meaning you partner, partner with the state organization and you um, then uh, create you know, um, a relationship with them to then change your zoning to allow that to happen. In Westfield's case, we had never applied to COA. Uh, before 2007 or 8, uh, we'd always been a town that's, that uh, went to the courts um, to satisfy its obligation or, it's, you know, have agreements approved, such as the RCA agreement with Elizabeth many, many years ago back in the 80s. And I'm sorry, Jim, just to clarify, when you say go through the courts, is that done on a case-by-case -case project basis or how does that interaction, how did that interaction with the court happen? Don, you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, the court towns... There are two ways to do it. Like the COA town, as Jim is mentioning, is uh, a municipality would um, file for something called substantive certification with COA. And it's basically um, Council on Affordable Housing, COA, reviews and endorses the town's affordable housing plan. Um, an alternative way was you, you go straight to the court. It's almost like, and I've never been involved with that particular uh, way, but it's basically the court is approving your housing plan rather than, than COA. Um, Currently, um, all towns are court towns. Um, under this latest round, where it, where it landed, essentially, the courts now have control of reviewing and approving housing plans, and, and that's what we've done in this latest round as well. Got it. All right, sorry, Jim. I just okay. wanted because I think I think that's very important, and I have I think it's something that our town should be very grateful for that we are a proud COA town, and um, and it emanated from really initial builder's remedy lawsuit back in 2007 and in a perverse way, that builder's remedy lawsuit enabled, kind of forced us or really forced the conversation about us being a proactive COA town, which I think has now set us up to be in a much better position than we maybe otherwise would have been. Did I say that accurately? No, I think you did. Uh, that's the thing, it, it was our initial full-time player that this, a lot of this is education, understanding the benefits. And so the town council was finally back in 2008 and 9 was convinced that we should be applying to COA. And of course, at that same time, the Bill of Germany lawsuit came in. As Don mentioned, it's very correctly. Now everyone's really a court town because COA has been uh, uh, really non-existent for the time being at the state level. And, um, but to go to your point, Mayor, so we, we 
the, the Village Remedy lawsuit, you know, uh, you know, really put a very distinct focus on things. And, you know, so now we flash forward, we go forward and we spent years negotiating uh, with the courts to get a housing plan approved. Don and I, I can at least a couple of days <laughs> in a car with a court assigned master. So towns were assigned a master to come in and work. So Westfield's a little different than some other communities in the sense that we are considered what they call a vacant land town, which basically means we have no vacant land. <laughs> we're fully developed and um, there's very small areas where we have the ability to do something new. Uh, and so we had a couple of creative ways to still comply with the regulations um, without having a lot of land. Other towns in South Jersey, for example, you, you know, we have land in all sorts of places. I go travel with my son to soccer games. I wish we had the land we had to do fields and all sorts of different developments, but we don't. Um, so we had a couple of creative ways to satisfy our obligations. And then I'll talk about the obligations in a little bit, um, but also, um, you know, make sure we have control of, of our destiny of the size and how many units we're having in town. Because if we didn't do that, if we weren't, we weren't proactive, we'd be uh, subject to further builders remedy lawsuits saying, hey, you have an obligation of X and you can't, you know, comply with it. Therefore, we're going to sue you. And the courts would likely, you know, the rule against us. We've seen that happen in some neighboring places that it's not a very advantageous position to be in. So we took that and you're right there. We are uh, all the years, obviously we, we comply, but now we're very proud of Coet Town. And, and let me give Don a little credit here more than he said himself. Um, we are not only a proud Coet Town, but due to our special affordable housing council, Jonathan Drill and Don Samet's efforts, our town planner here, we are thought of as probably one of the top five towns in the state, I would say that uh, we are complying with our regulations, our, our requirements, and we are looked to by Fair Share Housing, who we now not just work with, we collaborate with. They're a partner of ours. And uh, we're able to go back to them and get things done when we have created things on our own, which we'll talk about later as well, which can help the town and its development and planning efforts. That, that's something that doesn't happen very often, but that's a very good thing the town should be proud of uh, today where we are, so. So can you um, talk about that? Because I think a lot of what's news to people is the, the, the property that's been designated or allowed, um, enabled affordable housing. And I don't think people really pay attention, uh, nor understandably, until suddenly a project appears and it is, pre and is presented to the planning board or the council, whatever it may be. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. So you mentioned the master was literally driving around in a car with you and Don. And what were you, what were you just pointing out? Like, this could be a place. And I, how did you all arrive at where we netted out? And then can you talk about um, what properties ultimately were determined and why? Well, let me, I'll start, Don. I'll pass it to you. I, I guess um, if you were if you weren't proactive, what ends up happening is and this is kind of almost sounds silly, but it's true. If you don't be, if you're not being proactive with the courts master, people go on the Google Earth and look for open space, right? And we, of course, Westfield has some space, so we didn't want that to happen. We wanted to control of that. So the court master came in, and we drove around on multiple occasions. And Don had gone through and identified properties that either it's a combination of things: properties where things could happen, where there was nothing on the property, properties the town owned properties that could be in the need of rehab, uh, which is also a part of the program. Um, and we drove around the properties and, and by going there in person and seeing the property firsthand, what was happening there, that gave the master, you know, gave us credibility of the master to say, look, we're not just trying to push this property off the list. We're telling you this is functioning in this way and it's helpful to the town or vice versa. This could use to be rehab. This could use to be changed. And we want to see something happen here because it's been dilapidated and blighted for years. Uh, hence the Westfield Crossing Project, for example, uh, where we have land that's, you know, uh, this has been used for stores for years. Um, and so anyway, those are things that, that actually make a difference. And so, uh, but because we had so little vacant land and we had so many requests for areas to be looked at, um, everything from the, the armory, for example, National Guard Armory. Um, you know, what's being used there today? What could it be changed? That's in our plan as well. But a good example is Williams Nursery. Again, you know, here's a, here's a property that back in the 90s was decided that that should be a good place um, that if something was to happen, obviously it's got a lot of space there. The owners of the property, even today, 
they, they always knew that they, you know, that would shut down at some point and become um, uh, a new type of uh, residential living. And here we are almost 20 years later <laughs> and um, now finally getting to uh, a, a project of some sort. Uh, it, it can take as long as, as that. And one last thing to say before I pass it to Don, while we've complied with our first two rounds and now we have an excellent compliance and a court settlement for round three, uh, and we're in that till 2025, the difference today versus the two prior rounds, the rules change every round. There's different rules to comply with, different things you can and cannot do. And of course, you know, the, the developing market in, in the state of New Jersey, the develop, for developers has changed. So unlike the first two rounds of compliance, in this third round, not only we need to comply, we have a great relationship with affordable housing and fair share, but developers are now knocking on our door, literally on Don's door <laughs> regularly coming to us saying, oh, I see you have this uh, zoning that's here. I have an overlay zone. What can I do to, you know, to uh, see if that works for me? Can I, so we're entertaining developers regularly, but the point that the main, main thing is we now have control is you have an approved plan, Fair Share Housing endorsed it, the town council endorsed it, we're approved by the court and now we have control rather than, you know, trying to skirt our responsibilities and being subject to a bill's remedy lawsuit where then you lose control and all of a sudden you're, you're faced with a three or 400 unit complex that you can't control. So uh, Don, you wanna just tie into that? Because I think it's- and, Yeah, and let me ask a couple of follow-up questions to that which Don could probably answer. And I think one other point is that credibility that we now have, have with Fair Share enables us to make adjustments a bit on the way and we can talk about the adjustments that we're making on uh, related to the Williams Nursery site. But a couple of questions about the process. So you drive around with the master, right? Can you talk about ultimately what properties were identified, just generally speaking? After they're identified, then what, what had to happen to enable them? Uh, and, and we can go from there, Don. Okay, so, so I mean, why were we driving around in the first place? Um, we were because we knew that the town did have an affordable housing obligation, which it needed to address, right? So the question becomes, what are appropriate locations within Westfield where we can provide the units that we're obligated to provide? The benefit, as Jim said, you know, where do, where do things start? It starts from various professionals taking a mile high look, probably literally using Google Earth or Google Maps but no real indication of what is happening on the ground, right? So the court master came in and they said, um, all right, we've got a list of sites, show us around, show us what hap what's happening on each of these sites. We'll see if they are appropriate locations for affordable housing. I, I can remember actually uh, not only driving um, our court master around, but providing him maps, explaining what was going on in various sites. So in our tours with him, um, we looked at locations that were um, maybe in need of some rehabilitation. They had easy access to uh, downtown and other commercial areas in town. They had access to uh, mass transit, not only uh, bus, but also rail. So the locations that were selected um, primarily are along the North and South Avenue corridor and in our downtown. Um, so again, there are places where you would want to provide various means of transportation and, and ease of access to goods and services. Part of the work we did with the court pastor in identifying these locations was that we were able to keep our single family residential districts intact, right? Westfield is primarily detached single family housing. We were able to keep those areas zoned as they are. And we really focused on the North and South Avenue corridors and in the downtown area where multifamily and mixed use development is more appropriate than putting it out somewhere in the middle of a single family uh, residential zone. Um, okay, so let's talk numbers. Okay. And I just, I just want to reiterate a comment that Jim had made earlier because it's, um, it's important that people understand like why so many, you know, mm -hmm. if it's how many affordable housing, but um, uh, in order for it to be uh, profitable for a developer, they have to be able to put in what we call market rate units, right? 
Yeah. Um, the affordable units are six, 15% if they're rentals of the total project. So if our obligation is to provide six affordable units, that actually requires a 40 unit apartment building to generate those six. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what people not, you need to understand. Like Westfield Crossing, we're generating 32 units, right, Don? 32 uh, affordable uh, units? Uh, um, I think that's right. Uh, 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 yeah, I have it somewhere. <laughs> So, and that it's 50, and that's why that project might seem very large. It is our largest project, but it's 15 for only 15% of them are affordable. So that's what happens. Uh, and that's mandated by the courts in order to get the developers to, to even consider building this affordable, they have to give them the opportunity to make a profit. And that is why, um, even though our numbers might not be, be huge in terms of what the obligation is, it's only 15% of what needs to be built overall in order to meet that obligation. So that's just, I think, a really important point for people to understand. Right. So, um, so Don, so, um, and then just, just, I wanna talk about numbers so people understand our obligation, but after those areas are defined and then you all in a group work together to identify what is the appropriate density on each of these various sites based upon its location and, and what is reasonably to be considered, what can be managed without you know, traffic issues and so forth too much. Then there has to be, a, these, this is the zoning overlays. Um, and that's where, and talk about that process with the zoning overlays. And sure. it's also important to mention just because the zoning allows it to happen doesn't mean it will. That, so that, if you can talk, yeah. So just mention what that means, and then we're gonna. I want to talk about numbers. Sure. Well, um, well, each municipality. Um, I may have to dip into the numbers a bit here. Each municipality has um, an obligation that's comprised of three components. One is a prior round obligation from prior rounds of affordable housing requirements. Um, Westfield has satisfied its prior round obligation. The second is a rehabilitation obligation, which is, as the name implies, rehabilitation of substandard units. Westfield has also satisfied that obligation through participation in the Union County Home Improvement Program. The third is what's called um, prospective need or unmet need. And that's where the obligation to provide additional units um, comes about. So Westfield um, uh, has determined by our, our settlement and our court agreement an unmet need of 1,090 units. But that doesn't mean 1,090 affordable housing units are gonna be built. We, um, as was alluded to before, um, as Jim said, we don't have vacant land here in Westfield. So we're able to um, get what's called a vacant land adjustment showing that um, we don't have the opportunity to build or the ability to construct 1,090 affordable units. We have space for, we found 62 affordable units. So Don, I'm sorry, just how did they even arrive at that crazy number? Is it just a formula that they plug in based upon it, certain variables that have no it, basis in reality? Yeah, they have, they're based upon projected growth um, in the region, and then it filters down to municipality. Um, I'll use the, time, the term mile high again. It's mile high calculations. How the numbers were calculated were actually the subject of a lot of the litigation taking place surrounding the third round. Um, and even with the latest round of numbers, there were consortiums of municipalities that were um, arguing the numbers that Fairshire Housing Center came up with, and there was a whole back and forth. But um, it's basically, um, this may sound negative, but it's a bunch of, of academics sitting around and doing the calculations. And I don't mean- And it sounds like, and it sounds like it's a bunch of lawyers making a lot of money on it too. Uh, <laughs> but that's the conversation for another day. But so our crazy number of 1,090 actually gets down to 62. We, right. Well, it gets down to 62 that we can build. So the difference between 1,090 and 62 is um, our, what's called our unmet need. Um, so we have to provide the opportunity to, um, to help to meet that unmet need. It doesn't mean we, they have to be built out. There's no way we're going to see 1,090 units, 
but we have to address that op that unmet need. And how we've done that is through the creation, um, in part, there were some uh, zoning modifications to existing affordable housing zones. Um, we have a development fee ordinance where um, a certain new construction or rehabilitation requires payment into an affordable housing trust fund, which is used um, for various affordable housing programs um, in the town. Um, we have a mandatory affordable housing set aside for any um, project that is as a result of a zone change or a redevelopment plan that includes residential units at a certain density and certain number. Um, so Don, just to be clear on that, so mm -hmm. that would be in, a, in, a, in, a, in an area where maybe hasn't been zoned specifically yeah. or overly zoned and somebody yeah. comes and says, I wanna build an apartment project here they are obligated to set aside 15% of the, at least 15% of the units for affordable housing, right? Correct. Here, even though they're not in the zone. Correct. That in is the current zone. Yep. It would have, to, if it's a subject of a rezoning, a redevelopment plan, or um, a use variance granted, they'll have to provide it. See, again, it's addressing that unmet need. At present, right. we may not have an area that is, say, zoned for residential. But if, someone, if we create a redevelopment plan and say you can do it, well, you're mm -hmm. also required to put affordable um, housing within that development. And so if we get to, let me just clarify this. So our 62 is what they said, this is what we know you're able to build today, right? right? And 62 units is really four, wow. 400 um, apartments because 60 is 62 per, is the set aside essentially, right? So they say you're capable of building that today. And um, and then when we do that, that doesn't mean we're done. And I think that's right. the questions people people ask me: When are you finished? <laughs> yeah. When are you finished? Um, and I think it's important to understand um, we're not really even even when we met the unmet need, we're not really finished, and we're not even able to deny somebody if we got to our 62 and someone came to proposal, we have an obligation to enable that project right, as part yeah. of our continued obligation. Yeah. Yes. So the answer question is, we're not really ever really done. No, no, we have that, that unmet need um, and the overlay zones are, are part of meeting that unmet need. Um, there isn't like a, a, you know, we're done. I guess the we're done is every single piece of property that's identified for affordable housing is built out. The likelihood of that happening uh, probably not high at all, um, especially given that we're, um, what, six years now into our affordable housing plan, you know, we're, we're not near seeing a build out of all those lots. I, I think it's important to note, you know, I'm also talking about this 1,090 minus 62, but even with the, um, the remainder where we're required to address, the overlay zones don't come, the, the maximum build out not of affordable units, but total units is something like 690, 700 units in total. So we're never going to see this, you know, 1,090 or 1,028 number of affordable units built. Um, and, and then on top of that, the market rate units, we're going to see uh, much less. Mayor, do you, uh, want, uh, do you want to go yeah, through go the, uh, the projects real quick of that make up yeah. too? I think mean, just so the public can see. How that yeah. Um, I think, uh, and Jim, why don't you why, in between the two? Why don't you? What was the very first one we did? The first one was uh, probably three 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 central, right? Um, that mm -hmm. really was the first against the sixty two number. Um, so we had, yeah, we I mean, I'll, Don, you have more information, but I know we had three 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 central in the corner of South and Central. We have um, the Parker, which is on the corner of Rawway and West Broad. Uh, we have the Ross Place development, which is in the process of being built now. Uh, we have what I call the Pan Am, but as I now known as the Bentley, which is the old Pan Am cleaners in the traffic circle. I'm hearing rumors are changing their name now. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, so, yeah. so we have that. And then the last one is the West Hill Crossing, which we, we just recently approved. And those were all, Don, if I had this right, those were all, all those projects are part of the settlement agreement in 2017 to go against that 62 number, which the 62 number is known as the realistic development potential, right? 
uh, or some of that maybe you farm that need to, Don? So they don't all count towards our realistic development potential. Some of them count towards unmet need. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I and so I'll talk about three 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 central a bit because I've gone on the record that that's a project that um, I've never been, uh, and that's not just me. I've heard it from quite a few uh, residents and constituents about. Um, uh, Actually, people I think generally aren't that weren't necessarily even taking issue with the use. I mean, it was a blighted piece of property. It had that old house on. I remember there was some light in the top of the house. Do you remember that? <laughs> There's a road. I think what I what I think um, I certainly it's my personal opinion, but I think others have agreed that it was a bit of a lost opportunity to create something that could have been really. Um, impactful and beautiful um, as a gateway to Westfield. And I and it I I think that I, I think people feel it was a missed opportunity, and I certainly I do too. But the reality is, it's we're certainly what we're discovering, you know, with Westfield Crossing is that the margins on these properties for our developers is not really hot, and um, especially when the obligation is to build the affordable housing, even though they have market rate units. So there's uh, so as a result, you can get projects that don't provide um, the public benefits that we wish they did, that aren't built with the quality of the materials right. that they, we wish they were, and, um, and where we don't really can't necessarily dictate even the, number, the configuration of the bedrooms, one and two and three bedroom units, other than what's the minimum that's mandated by affordable house. So it was actually 333 Central, and we had never used redevelopment for any of our affordable housing projects. And so um, when I, my administration came in, many of these projects were already in the queue, either where they were done or they were far enough along in the process. It was Westfield Crossing, which is the Savelle's property that we're talking about, was the first one that really came in the queue. And um, I think we all agree that it is a gateway to Westfield from that east side of town, um, that it is in a blighted area that could benefit from a real um, uh, significant quality project that attracted great investment. And we thought that if there was an opportunity to use redevelopment to in order to get a better project and provide community benefit, we should do that. Um, and that's certainly where we netted out with um, Westfield Crossing. I think we've been working on it for what, two years? Yeah. It's been a pretty significant negotiation. And I do think um, it's gonna be a project that benefits the community and, uh, and the neighborhood, but um, uh, I think it's uh, it, not every project warrants redevelopment agreement. I think it does based upon the specific nature and visibility of the site, what kind of public amenities we might want out of that. But in my mind, 333 Central is one that might have been um, uh, done, a, had a greater community benefit if we had done that with the redevelopment. Yeah, and Mary, you want to, yeah, you may, maybe just to touch on the, uh, I mean, Don, maybe give, give the makeup of what's required the affordable housing obligation is required for make, uh, bedroom makeup whenever you have a unit but, uh, or a proposal because that's something people always ask me as well. Like why, why so many three bedrooms? Why, why, why two beds? There are, there are obligations for the, for the affordable housing units no matter what um, the developer wants to do. That's right. Yeah. The rules, um, they're called the Uniform Housing Affordability Controls and they, they dictate maximum and minimum percentages for efficiency in one bedroom units, two bedroom units and three bedroom units. So, I mean, it boils down to, you have to have a mix of those unit sizes. And really it's to prevent a builder from just putting in all studio affordable units, right? The, the intent of the legislation is that you're providing affordable housing for different size households. So you, you have a, a maximum percentage of efficiency in one bedrooms, minimums for two bedrooms and, and three bedroom uh, units and any affordable development. And it's only for the and, affordable units, not the market rate units. Right, and Don, and there's two things I wanna mention about that is one is, you know, we talk about affordable housing in the context of Westfield, I really think it's more workforce housing. Right. And the, and the income thresholds, there's very low, there's low and there's moderate. And I was just right. looking up and this is, I think two years old, that in Westfield, um, a family of four, um, a low, income is considered $45,000, moderate is considered $72,000. So it's 
So we're talking about what I like to call workforce housing. Right. It could be teachers, it could be public, uh, you know, it could be firemen, it could be social workers, uh, the type, you know, honestly, the folks that you want living in your community that no longer really can afford to be here because of really the elimination of our, what has eliminated our, uh, our starter stock, if you will. Um, and right. And the other thing that I want to mention that was one of the benefits, I think, of the pilot agreement we're doing at Westville Crossing, to your point, um, we can't, after, beyond the affordable housing obligation, if they need to make money by putting in more two and three bedroom uh, units uh, without an, a redevelopment agreement and in a pilot in particular, we do not have the tools to force them to change that mechanism that we worry about could, you know, have maybe a greater influence on schools. Westfield Crossing in particular is an example. They had initially came to us with a proposal with a significant number of three bedrooms. Um, and because of using, uh, which I know people, we could talk about schools in a second, but people's concerns about school crowding and so forth, we were able to mandate that they only provide the minimum number of three bedroom uh, units required by, um, by fair share. So, um, there is a benefit to these redevelopment agreements and pilots where you can have a little bit of latitude to be able to force things that could ultimately be better for the community. So Don, talk about schools, because that's there's two things that we hear about apartments, schools and traffic, right? So let's talk about schools first. So what is your experience on the impact of uh, these uh, new affordable housing uh, projects on schools? Well, you know, we look at the projects because they're a mix of affordable units and market rate units. And there have been studies done by Rutgers University. I remember reading one um, that came out of uh, the Center for Housing Studies at Harvard. And, you know, I think the perception is you build a multifamily um, development and there are all these school age students coming out of it. But the data is showing differently. Right, and um, Mary, you had actually done a, a survey of some of our local um, developments here as to what's coming out of those, um, what school-age children are coming out of those developments. And it's, it's really small. I, I remember um, uh, there was a, the South Orange uh, Village president, Gina Collum. She talked about a project in her town where there's a 33 unit project and they had one school-age child coming from it. And, and our numbers here are similar. Um, the numbers seem to come, and perhaps not uh, unexpectedly, from construction of detached single-family homes. You get the three, four-bedroom homes, even more, uh, here in Westfield, and they're being populated with um, uh, growing families. Um, so that's where, on a unit-by-unit -unit basis, that's where you're seeing your uh, school children impacts. Um, you certainly will get some school-aged children um, in multifamily developments, but they're not um, comparative really to what happens with detached single family housing. So, you know, I think the perception is, is certainly worse than the reality. Um, and there have been studies to show that. Yeah, I, and I agree. And that point is in Westfield of the 120 units that we built to date that Jim mentioned, it came with five school age children, which is, I know is less than half of, I think what even the Rutgers study would project. Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think, it, I will tell you, it does seem odd to me that it's like, okay, if you come and you build a new house, rip down new and build it, we're okay if you have kids. But if you rent in Westfield, we're not okay if you have kids. And mm. it just seems uh, a little, uh, I don't know, it just, it, it, it doesn't feel very equal. And, uh, and uh, so I do think that this narrative about apartments bringing lots of kids has not proving to be um, accurate. I also think what you're finding is that the rents on these places, the market rates are pretty pretty expensive. Um, and you could argue whether that's good or bad, but it is what it is. So if you're gonna spend $2,500 to $3,500 a month on rent, many of those people would prefer to own a single family home with their kids. And that's certainly what I think what the data is showing. And I could tell you just anecdotally from people who have called my office, we have, who, who am I hearing from? People that would want to stay in town, but not necessarily own the single family home. Um, folks who um, the families have uh, split by divorce and um, uh, one of the parents would like to stay in town, but will no longer be living in the detached home. Um, 
and uh, basically for folks who want a downtown living environment, but there are empty nesters, there are people that are newly in the workforce. Um, my office isn't getting calls from families that are interested in these affordable units or, or the market rate units as well. Okay, so we call them newly single, I think is the newly term. Single for, is the term okay. Newly single. <laughs> Exactly. Jim, were you going to say something? Yeah, this one, I, just want, I think this, this is just a tie on what Don said. Uh, maybe, Don, you just give a little information. It might be a good time to talk about our uh, third party administrative agent, uh, Community Grants Planning and Housing. It's important for two reasons. Um, one, um, there is a very you know, uh, legal process to qualify for these units. Right. And we have outside help for that. Uh, and Don will talk a little bit about that. We have a, it's on our website too. We can give you more information on that as well. And one other thing before Don talks about that is that um, just if anyone's wondering about how is this, how all, all this stuff being paid for? Um, <laughs> you know, so for example, um, as Don mentioned before, we have a, uh, a affordable housing trust fund. That trust fund, trust fund was established, um, I think 2013 or 14. But that is a triangular agreement between a local bank and fair share or, or the state fair share housing and the town approving the fact that we're collecting developers fees to be used for money so that the town taxpayers don't necessarily have to bear the burden of either creating affordable housing, paying for services to manage affordable housing. So for example, the local our, our uh, special affordable housing council is paid for out of the uh, affordable housing fund, any work he does. Uh, the community grants planning and housing the third party administrative agents paid for out of that. Uh, Don is named as our housing liaison. His money that he gets paid for that work, which seems to be a lot more these days than before, is also paid out of that. So the public should be very, um, you know, uh, thankful that a lot of the costs, and this was set up years ago to, to you know, make sure that taxpayers didn't have to actually bear the burden for that. And that money can also be used for rehabbing units, preparing, uh, you know, encouraging uh, uh, other units to be built without having to hit the, the taxpayer's wallet. So maybe Don, you talk about the community grants planning and housing. That's a good thing. Maybe some of the public might have questions about how do I qualify? You know how. That, I think yeah, qualify. that's I think people want to know how and what is the process for actually getting getting into an affordable unit. So that would be a sure. good thing to talk about. Sure. And then we can't. And then we have to talk about traffic because that's the other thing. So. <laughs> so um, we do contract with community grants planning and housing. They're responsible for um, administering all the applications for affordable units, um, for those units which are in town. They also handle a number of other municipalities throughout the state. And really the, the process to apply for and get in the queue for these affordable units, and there is, a, there is a very large demand for the units in Westfield, but you can either call them or go online. Um, the website is www.affordablehomesnewjersey.com. And you can fill out a pre-application right on the website, put in your information, indicate what units uh, you're interested in, whether they're Westfield or, or even in another municipality. I don't wanna really advertise for other municipalities, but you can do that. Um, if you don't have access to the, to the web or you'd like to share a phone number with somebody, it's area code 609-664-2769, extension five. And they not only administer the applications, they'll help, they'll coordinate between the landlord and the tenant. Um, they also administer um, an affordability assistance program for us which provides um, three months rental assistance to tenants of units. Um, and that uh, program is funded by our Affordable Housing Trust Fund as well. So um, I encourage anyone who knows of someone that's looking or is looking themselves to go to that website, call that number um, and fill out a pre-application. And there's one other thing there, I think it's important to note that um, people always ask me, I know they ask you as well, when are we going to have the market saturated? Is there enough, you know, how, how can we populate all these you know, apartments? And just to give you, give the public a sense, when we first had our first lottery through the community grants planning and housing, which is a requirement for the process initially, um, I think it was thousands of applications, thousands for six units. Just to give you the demand, the, the, the demand that there is for affordable units. So 
the affordable units are usually the first ones to be filled in every new complex right away. Um, but the demand is very high statewide, not just in Westfield. Westfield obviously is one of the more desirable places, but again, statewide demand is very high. So the affordable units uh, fill up very quickly uh, through the process. Yeah. And, and just to add on to that, Jim, because the other question is, well, why are we building more, apart more apartments when you know, we still have vacancies in the current ones. Well, I, the reality is these builders would not be building these apartments if they weren't confident in the uh, occupancy rate to make it worth their while. And so while you might have a perception that there's a high vacancy rate, there, it's, there is turnover in many of these and it's sufficient enough to make it, um, uh, you, you know, Westfield a desirable place to, to continue these projects. So I don't think that's, you know, what the perception versus what you might think is happening isn't the reality of the of the uh, project that we're getting. Right. I'm sorry, Don. I interrupted you. Oh, I was just going to say, um, you know, all of the numbers that uh, number of people that apply for these units is high. There's a preference given to the Westfield Housing Region. We're in what's called Region Two. So, I mean, it's Essex, Morris, Union, and Warren counties, right? Four big counties but not the entire state. Um, another common um, misunderstanding is that Westfield residents get priority. Um, unfortunately, they do, they do not. Only folks in the housing region will get a priority. So we can't earmark units uh, for Westfield residents. That would be against the state laws. Um, okay, so traffic. When you all um, worked with uh, Fair Share to identify the locations and the density of these things. Um, how was uh, traffic flow and circulation taken into consideration to identify those projects? Yep. And what are we doing? And, and just talk about what we're doing about it now uh, to make sure that we mitigate, um, you know, these uh, kind of inconveniences to residents. Yeah, it goes back in part to um, when I was speaking and, and Jim, Jim and I were both speaking about going around town with our uh, court appointed housing master. You know, we looked at areas where there was access to um, transit, um, where there was um, the ability to walk to goods and services. Um, so we want locations where there would be less reliance on the automobile, right? So hopefully that will um, shave off some of the vehicular trips that may normally occur from um, a development out in the hinterland somewhere or even in from the, the core of some of our single family areas. Um, so it was the ability or the ease to use transit if you so choose to, um, to walk and even to cycle. Um, for now, what we're doing now, um, as part of our update to our master plan, we had a, a traffic consultant come in and they looked at a build out of primarily the downtown area, but took into account um, the Westfield Crossing project. And they've made some recommendations for traffic signal improvements, timing improvements on them. And they've also uh, recommended to us some um, additional uh, studies or working with the county and or the state for the intersections at North Avenue and East Broad and the traffic circle. You know, we recognize that um, more units could bring more uh, vehicles, and especially when we look at what's happening in neighboring uh, municipalities, including Garwood. So we have to take a careful look at that. So it's, it's gonna be a combination, I think, of some traffic signal improvements, possibly some roadway improvements and working with county and state, and um, really promoting alternative modes of transportation, using transit when possible, walking when possible, getting on the bike when possible. And you look at the efforts such as you know, the green team and what they've done um, and the new, um, uh, forgive me, Mayor, it's the, the bicycle um, uh, committee involved with that. Um, so there's, there, and, and also the bike ped plan we've done. So we're trying to, as much as possible, get people out of their vehicles and don't use them when they don't have to, but also taking a careful look at what our existing infrastructure is able to accommodate. And we recognize that there's, there, I think there's, four intersections that seem to be hot issues that we are aware of. And they're I, I honestly, irrespective of even any new development, it is the right. South Avenue traffic circle. It's mm -hmm. that intersection of central and south. Yeah. Um, 
it's that intersection coming out of the North Avenue train station, mm -hmm. plus, and it's the intersection by Bavella's at um, uh, those seem to be yeah. the immediate hot button spots that we're aware of. Right. And we would like to think like bike, multimodal and bike lanes and all those are part of a larger vision. But certainly I, I think that's one of the things. Let me just, I was just gonna look at some of the questions that came in to see if we've covered them. Um, one was about traffic. Um, um, and one is about, um, I, I think it's more about how if someone, oh, I see, if someone goes into, and if I, this might be a question for, uh, maybe we can do, tell them how to go. If someone is in, qualifies for, for affordable housing and then they get in and their, um, their income rises so that they would no longer qualify as someone who is applying for the first time, um, are, can they stay as an affordable housing and pay that affordable housing rent or do they move into a market rate and open up a spot for somebody else? Uh, they you know that? I do. I, I check with our administrative agent. They actually can stay in the unit. Um, there's nothing that requires, nothing in the state law that requires any kind of annual certification for income. Sort of the, the pro this um, policy or law is that they can now save money to move on to something else, something um, better for them, if you will. And that mm -hmm. then will free up the unit. Um, but when the unit does become free again, it has to be marketed for uh, as an affordable housing. housing. Um, another question that came in, why is it the Williams nursery site being added to the adjacent Lenape Park? Um, is there a project coming up on North Avenue since several businesses are leaving? Um, do we require truly independent impact studies on road schools and other costs? So um, do you wanna talk to those, Don or Jim? Um, well, William's site, um, as Jim mentioned, has been part of our housing obligation since the early 90s. Um, as a private nursery, I believe we have to include it in our realistic development potential number, a site where affordable housing could be built. Um, it would take, obviously, um, someone to finance the purchase of that property, whether it's the municipality or the county, to um, then make it a public public land and make it part of Lenape Park. Um, so absent that, you know, you're competing against the private market uh, for some, for a purchase of the property. Um, yeah, just, just uh, that too, there's the, the Lenape Park is a county park. Yeah. Uh, and so there has never been any interest as far as we know about that, but Don's right. It, it, either the county or the town have to buy the property and it's an enormous property as everyone probably knows. And, um, uh, I'm not sure there's any interest in the county on annexing that to their property at this point. Uh, and then, Don, and then Don, do they, what, what kind of impact studies do we do for roads, schools, and so forth? Um, and who would pay for that? Well, um, really for traffic, it's part of, well, I mentioned the master plan work that we're doing. So it's accommodated in that in the, on a broad scale. But as part of um, these, these major projects, they go in for a site plan review with the planning board. So the planning board would look at um, access and egress from, to and from the site. They would look at internal circulation, um, any necessary infrastructure that needs to be put in would be uh, as part of site plan approval. A good example of that is 333 Central. There were some intersection improvements there, putting in a, a dedicated right turn lane, uh, namely. Um, school age children um, studies are typically not part of a site plan application, um, but I know that you know the town is in constant contact with Board of Education regarding um, the potential for uh, school impacts. And, and thank you for bringing that up, Don, because um, we do host, uh, and certainly we're doing it in person, uh, regular meetings with um, the school superintendent and Dana um, Sullivan, the administrator, and typically the uh, president and vice president of the Board of Ed. Um, we're gonna be going uh, back to that and we, we kind of lay out the roadmap for what development is happening. Um, we talk about uh, their school uh, age projections. Um, the student population has been declining for the last six years. I think they're projecting next year to be back where they were in 2015, I believe. So, um, so as, as a, there is no concern at this point about uh, pro, you know projected impact on 
on schools for all the reasons that we mentioned before. Um, and one other question, I'll just bring it up again. Someone asked about the housing, the income required for housing. And Don, in our, when, when a project is uh, completed, does, does fair share dictate, I know there's very low, there's low and there's moderate. Does each project have to include some of each or not necessarily? Yes, no, they do. Um, no okay. more than 50% of the affordable units can be for moderate income. Um, Got it. And then uh, the other 50% is um, a, a mix of the low and very low income. The very low income requirement is I think 13 or 15% of the affordable units need to be for very low. Got it. So uh, I think the, from what I understand, the majority of the apartments are being occupied by two members, of, give or take. Mm -hmm. um, and just for the point of reference, and this I think this data is two years old, but um, a very low income is identified as about $22,000 a year. Low is about $36,000 a year and moderate is $58,000 a year. So as I said earlier, um, if 50% of the units are required for moderate income, that is your, you know, your social worker, entry level public school teacher, et cetera. So, um, and obviously it would be great if we could keep them in the community. So. Um, let me ask Kim, are there any uh, questions, Kim, that have come up? I think you covered most of them, May. Are there two others that are um, that we can speak to? One is about um, the obligation that Westfield has. Is there a public document anywhere uh, that residents can access that speaks to and breaks down those obligations? Yeah, it's our, it's our housing element and fair share plan, our 2018 housing element and fair share plan. And Kim, it is up on uh, the website. Uh, I'll drop the I'll drop the link in the comments. Okay. And, and actually, again, this important point is in that plan, if I'm not mistaken, Don, there is specific details on the RDP, the unmet need numbers, and, and yes, specific, you know, how how we met the 62, or how we're going to meet the 62, and uh, et cetera. So it's all right there in the plan. That's right. And we also did a kind of an FAQ document back in 2018, which is still relevant. So that's also on the town website as well. And then Mayor, we had a question uh, asking, can we address benefits to downtown businesses who suffer from lack of weekday foot traffic? Yeah, actually, um, I, I'm i pretty excited, quite honestly, for um, the Bentley, which maybe might now might go by another name to be opened. I think of Lions Roar Brewery is very excited for that to open. Um, and just to, I, and I will say, I've said this Previously, I think I wasn't part of the settlement that these guys had uh, reached previously, but I think generally did a really good job of putting these, uh, identifying these sites across on the railroad tracks and close to our downtown. Um, and as I keep saying, our downtown to really uh, revitalize it, we need to revitalize the ecosystem that supports the businesses there. And that means we need people living and working in our downtown to create ongoing organic foot traffic. So I think the, the benefit of, uh, I'll just a little anecdote. I have a friend that actually um, rents a office space downtown. And he said he had never, he lives in Scotch Plains. He said he never ever shopped in downtown Westfield. Since he works here, he doesn't shop anywhere else. And, uh, and, I, and I think he's just a small little anecdote, but I think you know, if you can walk to a place and buy your, you know, whatever it may be, um, you will. And that ultimately is what's going to attract new businesses. So uh, I think that those are going to be great, and particularly for the South Side. And Anything else, one, Kim? Yep, one more that came in regarding seniors. Are any of these projects going to have housing for 55 and over adults, including affordable housing? We have, in terms of, um, affordable requirements or the, the requirement to build affordable units, the town has actually maxed out the number of units that it can claim for affordable um, housing credit for seniors. Um, so that does not prevent someone from coming in and building age-restricted housing um, where it's zoned for it. Um, that can always happen, but you're not gonna see it created as a result of any affordable housing obligation. Yeah, I think Don, we actually exceeded our, uh, not even actually, we did. Yeah. our numbers. So that's, yeah. that's unusual for a community yep. where 
yep. our, our affordable housing requirements for seniors have been well exceeded in the last right. uh, round. So uh, again, there's always a need for more <laughs> as we as we hear yeah. the question, but uh, nothing is precluding someone to come and, and propose that to us. But we wouldn't get any credit for that piece of it now because we've already exceeded that particular section of it. That was my special court um, order decision from years ago. And, and last comment, Don, about what's next. So the next obligate, next round is 2025. 25. And talk, what happens? Like, do they, like, what, what, what are they looking at and how, what do they determine? Well, we don't know, right? So um, we don't know if the legislature, the state legislature is gonna change the rules. Um, what of the existing rules is gonna stay in place? What's gonna change? Is the Council on Affordable Housing gonna be um, reinvigorated and they'll be um, taking a, a, a bigger role than they were able to in this latest round and it will will it be therefore taken off of the court's hands um, so we're not quite sure we don't know what a fourth round rules may be I some I'm sure some of the folks that are you know doing the deep dives into all this might have an idea but I haven't heard anything uh, yet but we're constantly monitoring to see uh, what's going to happen but the good news I'll say mayor is that um when we get to that point in 2025, as Don mentioned, he's absolutely right. You know, the second round was in litigation for years over the growth share litigation. So it could be years before it comes to a fruition. But the good news for Westfield, we'll be able to say that we have met our realistic development potential, RDP, that we have started to chip away at our unmet need. And we have, um, uh, you know, obviously provided opportunities through zoning, overlay zones particularly, and also met our rehab requirements, et cetera. So we'll have a lot of good things to report at that time, even more so than today. Uh, the question is, what are the new rules going to be or what are the, what are the rules going to be the same or not? But we have a lot of good things to report between uh, now and then, I'm sure. Well, I, you know what, we can end on that note because I, I wanted the community to know um, that they should be very proud of, I think, your efforts and our, our reputation and relationship with the fair share. Um, I think, you know, we have done a really terrific job and so much, there's uh, um, some council action that's happening, I think tonight, uh, at, well, I should say at the planning board and then next week, um, we have, uh, re we're relocating some of our affordable housing obligations, fixed units over to the Williams nursery site. And they're being relocated from the, the Handler building on North Avenue, which is adjacent to Westfield Lumber, if anyone knows of it, uh, for two reasons. One is there's an interested contract purchaser who actually wants to rehab the building and keep it and turn it into something really interesting that's gonna benefit the community. Um, and so, you know, that's always um, uh, something that we wanna do and it's gonna be a good economic development driver. But as it was zoned for affordable housing, meaning, that nothing else could have been there other than other, either, if it wasn't what it was, the only thing that could be there was a minimum 40 apartment unit, a maximum 40 apartment building with six affordable units. So by relocating the six units, affordable units to the Williams nursery site, it mitigates the incremental impact on any incremental density on the Williams nursery site. and now takes away a 40 unit building, potential building on the, what we call the handler site and any potential concerns that people might have about traffic. And now we could potentially get something that has gonna have a big community benefit. But we are only able to make those transfers because of our relationship and um, uh, reputation with fair share housing and because of how we've lived up to our obligations thus far. So I would want the community to know that there are benefits for having done that and our ability to to be a bit flexible and adapt to opportunities that might present themselves that you couldn't have foreseen when you did it, when we initially created that, um, that settlement. Yeah. So on that note, thank you so much. I know it was a, it's kind of complicated. I hope this was helpful to all of you. Um, it's, uh, it's not easy and there's never a very quick solution, but I just do want to give my hats off to Jim and to Don um, for all the work that they've done to get at this point. And just know that we're doing our best to live up to our obligations while making sure that we're providing, uh, we're maximizing the benefits to the community and mitigating whatever um, concerns you may have about this uh, court order obligation that, uh, that we're fulfilling. So on that note, thank you everybody. Enjoy the rest of your very hot afternoon.
Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, everybody.